August, the Elvis Presley fan club takes several hundred of its members on a superb memorial tour to the USA. The tour always includes a visit to Memphis, Tennessee, and to the much smaller rural city of Tupelo, Mississippi, where Elvis Aaron Presley was born. Tupelo, the seat of Lee County, lies 104 miles southeast of Memphis. Two railroads pass through the city, the Illinois Central and Gulf Railroad and the Burlington Northern Railroad. The once poor region is today a thriving community with prospering industry, but the people still retain their southern hospitality and visitors are assured of a warm welcome. So come aboard for this special Elvis tour. Elvis's birthplace, the humble dwelling that's become Tupelo's greatest tourist attraction. The two-room wooden house on Old Saltillo Road in East Tupelo was built in 1934 by Vernon Presley, his father, and his brother, Vesta. Vernon was 17 when he married Gladys Smith in 1933. Gladys was four years older and lived in nearby Berry Street. When Gladys found she was pregnant in the summer of 1934, Vernon asked his employer, Orville S. Bean, for a loan to buy timber to build a house. Bean, a dairy farmer, then rented the house to Vernon. On January the 8th, 1935, Gladys Presley knew her time had come. A baby boy was born at 4.05 a.m., but was stillborn. 30 minutes later, a second child was safely delivered by Dr. William Hunt. He was named Elvis Aaron, and he was destined one day to become the most famous entertainer in the world. The stillborn twin, named Jesse Garron, in the local fashion of rhyming names, was buried next day in Priceville Cemetery, about a mile to the east. The Presleys lived in their modest home during the first years of Elvis's life. They had to live hand in hand with poverty, plus the harsh extremes of the Mississippi weather. But one thing they had plenty of was love. Love of each other and love of God. The humble little birthplace is a culture shock, especially after seeing the splendor of Elvis's Graceland mansion in Memphis. There were no luxuries like air conditioning and indoor plumbing. Life in such a dwelling in the depression hit 1930s can't have been easy. The birthplace was restored by the ladies of the East Heights Garden Club in the early 1970s and was open to the public on the 1st of June 1971. The furnishings aren't the original of course but are similar to what the Presleys would have had. After Elvis died, his birthplace was designated as a Mississippi State Historic Monument. Extensive landscaping of the surrounding area was carried out. The old Saltillo Road became Elvis Presley Drive, and the area around the birthplace is now known as Presley Heights. Fans come from all over the world to visit the tiny house where the king of rock and roll was born. The people of Tupelo are true purveyors of southern hospitality, and that goes for the friendly motorcycle policemen too. They provide a royal escort for the coachloads of British fans who arrive each August, and with the chief of police leading the way, they escort the convoy from the outskirts of the city, around the places associated with Elvis, and to the birthplace. They seem to enjoy themselves as much as the fans. The Brits, plus a fair number of fans from many European countries, have been coming to Tupelo since 1972. The official Elvis Presley fan club of Great Britain made their first visit to Tupelo in late August 1972, during their first visit to the USA. They saw Elvis's birthplace, his palatial Memphis home, and finally the king himself in Las Vegas. The welcome from the Tupeloans, like the weather, was very warm. The club's made annual visits ever since, the visits nowadays being part of their memorial tours to the USA, and there's always a genuine, friendly welcome, along with a moving memorial service, for the folks in Tupelo are proud that Elvis's roots are in their fine city. There's a nominal charge of a dollar to go through the birthplace, and the money helps with the upkeep of the house. After Elvis became famous, he gave benefit concerts to raise funds to build a youth centre for underprivileged children in the area surrounding the birthplace, 
to be known as Elvis Presley Park. It was a project close to his heart and he visited the park in the early 1960s. There's a swimming pool, clubhouse and other facilities for the neighbourhood kids. The Elvis Presley Memorial Chapel now stands on a rise near to the birthplace. Elvis attended Lawhorn Elementary School from 1941 to 1946. Back in those days, it was known as East Tupelo Consolidated School. When he was 10 in 1945 and in the fifth grade, his teacher, Mrs J.C. Grimes, asked if anyone could say a prayer at assembly. It was in this very auditorium, which probably hasn't changed very much since Elvis's day, that a day or two later, young Elvis came forward and sweetly sang Old Shep, such a sad song about a boy and his dog that it made Mrs Grimes cry. She told the principal, Mr J.D. Cole, and he decided to enter Elvis into the talent contest at the forthcoming Mississippi-Alabama State Fair and Dairy Show in Tupelo. After he became famous, Elvis paid at least one visit back to his old school and his old teacher. In September 1946, Elvis started in the sixth grade at Milam Junior High School. His family had moved from East Tupelo into the area of Tupelo known as Shake Rag. It was around this time that he got his first guitar. He used to take it to school with him and play for anyone who'd listen. One time he sang with a band at a school dance. In 1948, the Presleys made plans to move to Memphis, Tennessee. On his last day at school, his teacher let Elvis sing Leaf on a Tree before saying goodbye to his classmates. This is the marker placed close to Elvis's birthplace by the Mississippi State Historical Commission. It was unveiled on the 8th of January 1978. It's a favourite place for fans to have their photograph taken. You'll recognise the handsome features of Rick Nelson. He visited the birthplace during the British club stay in Tupelo in August 1984 and mingled with the fans. Rick, or Ricky as he was known back then, had many hits in the late 50s and early 60s. Great songs like Hello Mary Lou, Believe What You Say, My Bucket's Got a Hole in It and It's Late. Playing a mean guitar on all of these rock classics was the legendary James Burton who of course joined Elvis's band in 1969. Rick, still a popular and likeable figure in the mid 80s, obligingly gave autographs to the Elvis fans during his walkabout in Elvis Presley Park. Elvis and Rick knew and respected each other back in the early days and Elvis paid Nelson the compliment of including one of his rock standards, My Babe, in his concerts when he began performing again in Las Vegas in 1969. The reason for Rick's visit to Tupelo was to perform in a benefit concert at the Ramada Inn Convention Center, together with his group, the Stone Canyon Band. You may recall their 1970s hit, Garden Party. Sadly, this great talent was lost to the entertainment world less than 18 months later. Rick Nelson died in a plane crash on New Year's Eve 1985, whilst on his way to Dallas. This is the familiar face of Joan Deary, a regular visitor to Tupelo. She still continues to visit, although no longer working for RCA. Another visitor to Tupelo in August 1984 needs no introduction. Friday the 10th of August was proclaimed as Colonel Tom Parker Day, Mrs. Janelle McComb, one of Tupelo's best-known citizens, seen here with the Colonel, knew him back before he ever became Elvis's manager. Ms. McComb knew the Presley family well, too, and was the force behind Tupelo's Elvis Presley Chapel of Inspiration. During the banquet at the Hilton on the 10th of August, Elvis Presley travel service boss David Wade, in Todd Slaughter's absence, made a presentation to the Colonel of a fine English crystal decanter and put on record the British club's appreciation of all he'd done in promoting Elvis. Colonel Parker, plus his minders, met the fans and gave autographs at a walkabout in Elvis Presley Park during the weekend following the banquet.
the fading facade and the peeling paint of the old Lyric Theatre in Tupelo. The place has obviously seen better days. These yellowing newspaper pictures show graphically the devastation of the tornado that hit Tupelo in 1936. In just 32 seconds, 216 people were killed, over a thousand injured and 900 homes destroyed. Mercifully, the Presley's home in East Tupelo was spared. Following the disaster, a sermon was given at the Lyric Theatre asking if God sent the tornado. This must have been a question that the God-fearing people of Tupelo asked themselves many times. Tupelo's fine courthouse has a cupola that is one of the best-known landmarks in the city. The entrance is equally as imposing. The story goes that while Elvis was attending Milam Junior High School, he'd go and sit under the shady magnolia trees at the courthouse and play his guitar and sing. The Tupelo Hardware Store on West Main Street is where Elvis bought his first guitar. It was probably in January of 1946, when Elvis celebrated his 11th birthday, that Gladys took him to the store to choose a gift. He wanted a bicycle, but his overprotective mother wasn't keen, especially when she saw the $55 price tag. She asked if Elvis wouldn't rather have a guitar, since that was much cheaper, just $12.95. Elvis reluctantly agreed, if he could have the bike later on. The salesman at Tupelo Hardware, Mr Forrest Bobo, sold Elvis the guitar. He eventually got his coveted bike at Christmas 1947. Elvis and his guitar became inseparable. He was taught chords by his pastor, the Reverend Frank Smith, and his uncles, Vesta Presley and Johnny Smith. Even at that early age, his musical influences were being formed by the country music he heard on the radio and the spiritual music he heard in the First Assembly of God Church. Elvis never learned to read music, but despite what some people say, he did learn to play the guitar. These are the old hog pens and cattle sheds at the Tupelo Fairgrounds. The Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show is held in Tupelo each autumn. In October 1945, when he was 10, Elvis was entered by his school principal in the Children's Day Talent Contest. He stood on a chair to reach the microphone and sang Old Shep unaccompanied. He won second prize, five dollars and free admission to all the rides and attractions. After he became famous, Elvis returned to Tupelo to give several benefit performances at the fairgrounds. The return of their local hero was a big occasion for tiny Tupelo. Excitement had been growing for weeks. 26th of September 1956 was declared Elvis Presley Day, with a street parade preceding two blockbuster concerts on a stage erected in front of these grandstands. Fans came from far and near to watch Elvis, wearing a blue velvet shirt and white buck shoes, deliver songs like Don't Be Cruel, Heartbreak Hotel, Love Me Tender and Hound Dog, in the style that had recently earned him the title King of Rock and Roll. Elvis donated his $10,000 fee to the Elvis Presley Youth Centre project in Tupelo. He was given the key to the city by the governor of Mississippi. Plenty of film footage of the afternoon show exists, and in 1984, RCA released the concerts on Elvis, a golden celebration. Imagine these stands being filled with screaming, swooning teenagers and Elvis grinning, rocking and shaking a leg. The King returned to the fairgrounds a year later, on the 27th of September 1957, creating more hysteria. The 11th of August 1987, and the 1100 or so fans on the 10th anniversary memorial tour gathered for a class of 87 group photo at the fairgrounds. You see, I don't understand y'all any better than y'all understand me. <laughs> Fans from all over the UK and most European countries sat on the hard, hot, wooden bleachers of one of the grandstands. Our revered leader, Mr Todd Slaughter, was dressed appropriately for the occasion in a headmaster's cap and gown, to the amusement of all. It took quite a while to get everyone seated and ready, and by the time the photos were eventually taken by two men on a towering crane, everyone was melting in temperatures of around 100 degrees, 
and praying for a cloud to obscure the sun. With the strong midday sun burning the pale skin of the fans, who'd only arrived in Tupelo from London two nights before, and the high humidity causing clothing to stick to bodies, everybody was glad to escape to the air-conditioned coolness of the Tupelo Mall, or to visit the Elvis-themed McDonald's and relax and sip a long, cold drink. The previous day, the 10th of August, was Fan Appreciation Day in Tupelo, and the Elvis Country Fan Club had unveiled a plaque detailing Elvis's appearances at the fairground. The intense heat caused problems. This unfortunate young lady succumbed to heat stroke. Like everyone else, she appreciated the air-conditioned comfort of Continental Trailway's huge buses. There were around 20 coaches in the 1987 convoy, and banners proclaiming Elvis Presley Fan Club on tour were displayed just in case anyone didn't know what this mammoth convoy represented. A sign denoting Elvis Presley Grandstand was also unveiled on the 10th of August 1987. Liberty Land, the theme park in Memphis that Elvis loved to visit. And this is the Zippin Pippin, the white knuckle roller coaster that was one of Elvis's favourite rides. He loved the fairgrounds and many times rented them from midnight until dawn in the 1960s and 70s at a cost of $17,000. He'd invite family and friends, plus any fans who happened to be around, to go along too. Originally called the Mid-South Fairgrounds, the name was changed to Liberty Land in 1976 to coincide with the American Bicentennial. Once he got on the Zippin Pippin, Elvis was loath to get off, as many fans, and their stomachs, found to their cost. He'd ride non-stop on the giant roller coaster up to 20 times in a row, either in the front or rear car, and he liked to stand up as the ride rose and dipped. It was undoubtedly a foolhardy thing to do, and nail-biting for any spectators. But that was Elvis, living up to his nickname, Crazy. His other favourite ride was the Fender Bender bumper cars. Again, he'd ride for hours on end, bumping off all opposition with a great big grin on his face. Elvis loved to win, and he usually did. He made sure that everyone had a good time, encouraging them to join in the fun rather than stand on the sidelines. It was free popcorn and Pepsis, or whatever else they fancied. Elvis was still a child at heart, living out his boyhood fantasies. The last time that Elvis visited Liberty Land was on the 8th of August, 1977, when he took his nine-year-old daughter, Lisa Marie, and her friends for a night of fun and thrills. Each August, there's an Elvis tribute at Liberty Land with singer Andy Childs. Elvis appeared in his first big show, a country jamboree headlined by Slim Whitman, at Memphis's Overton Park Shell Auditorium on the 30th of July 1954. He was billed as Ellis Presley, and he was so nervous that his legs were shaking. The start of the famous Presley gyrations, perhaps. This is the former premises of Crown Electric Company on Poplar Avenue. Elvis worked there in 1954, driving a pickup truck and studying to be an electrician at night school. 706 Union Avenue, the legendary Sun Recording Studio. In 1985, a Tennessee State historical marker was unveiled by owner Sam Phillips. The studio has been carefully restored to give it atmosphere and an authentic feel of what it must have been like in the mid-50s when Elvis made his first recordings here. Today, Graceland operates tours of the studio. At the control panel in Sun's sound booth is Sam Phillips, the foresighted genius who signed Elvis. This picture dates from around the time he first recorded Elvis. 
Gladys Presley bestows a kiss on her son at a gathering at Sun's studio. The photo shows Bob Neal, Elvis's manager at the time, an RCA attorney, Vernon Presley, Elvis, Gladys and Colonel Tom Parker. Sam Phillips, the RCA attorney, and Elvis pose here. Elvis first visited Sun's subsidiary, the Memphis Recording Service, in the summer of 1953 to make a private recording of My Happiness. A year later, Sam Phillips contacted him, put him in touch with guitarist Scotty Moore and bassist Bill Black, and the result of their first recording session was That's All Right, Mama, and Blue Moon of Kentucky, a totally original sound. Four more singles followed, plus other tracks that weren't released until after Elvis signed with RCA in November 1955. All this heavy equipment looks so antiquated now, especially this outsized old microphone, but what a brilliant pure sound Sam achieved. The Elvis tracks still sound as fresh today as when they were cut some 35 years ago. Elvis revisited Sun in December 1956, when the famous Million Dollar Quartet session took place, with other Sun artists, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis, joining Elvis to sing mostly gospel songs. Huge blow-up pictures of Elvis adorn the walls of Sun Studio today. You hear the Elvis story told and listen to some of the innovative tracks he cut here when you take a tour of the studio. The studio is still in use today. You too have recorded here. What a depressing sight, but one all too familiar in the USA. These old automobiles lie rusting in the yard adjoining American Sound Studio. It's hard to believe that in 1969, Elvis cut brilliant tracks like Suspicious Minds and In the Ghetto in this dilapidated place. The studio, demolished in July 89, was in an unsafe, run-down area of Memphis. On Beale Street is Lansky's famous men's outfitters store. Clothiers to the King, they call themselves. The sign mentions the rare photos of Elvis that are displayed in the store. Lansky's famous Memphis mural. This photo dates from about 1962 and shows Elvis trying on an outfit attended by Mr Lansky, who knew him well. Lansky's cater mainly for big and tall men and is one of Memphis's best-known shops. As a teenager, Elvis used to window shop here, and after he became famous, he bought many of his colourful clothes from Lansky's, becoming their best-known customer. A genuine Elvis autograph, given by the King to Bernard Lansky, and no doubt much prized today. In an area north of downtown Memphis, at 185 Winchester Street, are the Lauderdale Courts, a low-income public assistance housing project. The Presleys moved into Lauderdale Courts in 1949, after leaving the slum-like one-room apartment in a shabby rooming house on Poplar Avenue, which had been their first Memphis home. Fifties Elvis, outside Lauderdale Courts, in his ROTC uniform. Nowadays, this part of Memphis is a poverty-stricken black area, and it's not a safe place to venture on your own. Many taxi drivers won't even go into the area. The fan club's coach tour is probably the best way to get a glimpse of Lauderdale Courts. Elvis's family were allocated a ground floor apartment with two bedrooms and paid $35 a month rent in line with their low income. Elvis's grandmother, Minnie Mae Presley, came from Tupelo to live with them. Elvis lived at Lauderdale Courts during the greater part of his school days in Memphis. Hume's High School is not too far away from here. Although it was undoubtedly a step up from their previous squalid apartment, Life at the courts was no bowl of cherries. The apartments, built by the federal government in the mid-1930s, were best described as adequate, 
with few home comforts. Little spare cash was available to buy the things that make a house into a home. Ceiling fans provided some relief from the intense summer heat and humidity. The plumbing was pretty basic. Elvis was able to have more of the freedom that a teenager needs, but there was little he could do about the seedy area he lived in. It's to his credit that he managed to keep out of the trouble that he might have got into by living in such an area. In November 1952, with Vernon working at United Paint and Gladys working as a nurse's aide at St Joseph's Hospital, their combined income took them over the limit allowed. They were given notice to quit and moved out on the 7th of January 1953. The Playhouse may be a name unfamiliar to Elvis fans, but this theatre used to be known as the Memphian. It was one of the cinemas that Elvis used to rent out for his midnight movie shows. He'd invite fans and friends and show both first-run Hollywood features and his old favourite films. The fans who attended the midnight movies in the 1960s and 1970s said that Elvis used to enjoy himself immensely. Sometimes he'd answer back the actors on screen. And if he didn't like a film, he'd have them take it off halfway through and put the next one on. He'd watch old favourites like Patton with George C. Scott and Dr. Strangelove with Peter Sellers over and over. He thought Sellers was the funniest person ever. He rarely showed his own films. There'd be popcorn, candy and soft drinks available. Some of the seats had name plaques on the armrests. This one's for Marion Keisker, the receptionist at Sun Studio, and right next to it is Elvis's personal seat. He always sat in the same seat. Everyone else had to sit behind him, otherwise they'd be turning round to look at him all the time. The movie shows usually lasted until dawn, then Elvis headed back home to Graceland. He used this side exit, down in the alley, when he left the theatre. The Hollywood-style premiere of This Is Elvis was held at the Memphian on April the 3rd, 1981, and a few years later the name was changed to The Playhouse. From Memphis to Hollywood. This huge sign on the hillside above Hollywood Boulevard is one of the film capital's best-known landmarks. Elvis's first movie in 1956 was Love Me Tender. He made 31 scripted movies in all, the final one being Change of Habit in 1969. Many of his films were lightweight musicals, and his best acting performance and his own personal favourite film was King Creole in 1958. This is Bel Air, a select area in the Hollywood Hills with numerous luxurious and elegant homes of movie stars and other rich and famous people. Bellagio Road is a long and winding road just north of the Sunset Strip and close to the exclusive Bel Air Country Club. Elvis rented a large Mediterranean-style house at 1059 Bellagio Road around the beginning of 1962, whilst he was still in Hollywood finishing work on Kid Galahad. The house had a red tiled roof, curved white walls, balconies, shutters at the windows and was up a long driveway. It was shielded from the roadway and the ever-present fans by hedges and thick shrubbery. Another star who has a home in this area is Tom Jones, whose house is in the background on the left. The first house that Elvis ever bought in California was at 1174 Hillcrest Road in the exclusive Truesdale Estates area of Beverly Hills. 
It cost him $400,000. He and Priscilla moved in a few months after they were married. The house is multi-leveled in French Regency style with a guest house and pool and sits on the topmost slope of a mountain overlooking Los Angeles. There are many photos of Elvis taken in the driveway or at the gates of this house showing him with fans like Sue Weigert. These are more of the lovely homes along Bellagio Road. The house that Elvis lived in had a huge marble entrance hall, a mirrored master bedroom, a bowling alley in the cellar, and a downstairs den with a movie projector and a screen hidden by curtains. Elvis's pet chimpanzee, Scatter, once swung on the curtains and went right through the screen. Elvis only lived at the Bellagio Road address for six months. He thought that it was too much like a mausoleum and he kept getting lost in it. Rocker Place in Bel Air is located high in the hills just off the Stone Canyon Road. Elvis rented a house here in late 65 or early 66. He was living here at the time of his marriage in May 1967. In those days the house looked vastly different than it does today. Then it was a low, one-storey, rather plain modern ranch style house nestling in scrubby mountainside. On one side of the house was a large patio and swimming pool. The pool area hasn't changed a great deal. The stone urns that Elvis had painted an electric blue are still here, but are back to their original natural colour. The house has now been remodelled into a two-storey English Tudor-style home, and a cantilevered tennis court has been built out on the mountainside. The shrubbery round the house has grown extensively, and ivy covers the fence that fans once used to hang over. In fact, lack of privacy was the reason Elvis moved. There was a mountain road up above the house where fans and others would gather with binoculars and telephoto lenses, and Elvis couldn't use the pool or patio. And naturally, after he and Priscilla were married, they needed even more privacy. Perugia Way in Bel Air, which crosses Bellagio Road, is where Elvis rented his first Hollywood home in late 1960. He'd stayed in a suite at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel up until then. Elvis and his friends lived at Perugia Way until late 1965. It was ideal since it was built in a semicircle and everyone had their own room. Elvis moved out in 1962 to the Bellagio Road house, then six months later moved back. The house had pinball machines, pool table, jukebox and several TVs. The back of the house and the pool area overlook the golf course at the Bel Air Country Club. There are stories of Elvis and his friends buying BB guns, throwing flash bulbs into the pool and shooting at them. And one time Elvis rode his Harley Davidson into the living room his co-star in Viva Las Vegas, Anne Margaret, used to visit Elvis here in 1963. And this is the house where, in August 1965, the famous meeting took place between Elvis and the Beatles. Elvis often let his fans visit and share in the evening's fun, which usually amounted to watching television, shooting pool, listening to records, or just chatting. There were always soft drinks, pizzas and hamburgers available. The neighbours didn't like all the fans hanging around, or Scatter, or Elvis and his friends all riding their motorbikes, and often called the police. A feature of the house is the atrium, or garden, in the centre. When Elvis lived here, he put in a second den, and instead of the waterfall, he built a circular fireplace in which there'd be a fire on cool evenings. There was pale tangerine carpeting and comfortable curved off-white settees with lots of cushions. The living room had a secret entrance. The walls would open 
and Elvis would suddenly appear. Elvis spent Christmas 1961 here. This rare film of the Perugia Way house has a special significance. In 1988, the house was demolished to make way for a huge mansion. The azure skies and tall palms along Sunset Boulevard and the lovely climate of Southern California are very appealing. But Elvis was always glad to wrap up a movie and head back to Memphis and the seclusion of Graceland. He wasn't part of the Hollywood crowd and didn't like the parties and premieres that are so much a part of Tinseltown. One of Hollywood Boulevard's attractions honours stars of movies, TV and records. Elvis's star is set in the sidewalk near Mann's Chinese Theatre, where the star's handprints in cement can be seen. Elvis's star marks his achievements in the recording field, and everyone makes a beeline for it whenever the fan club tours Hollywood. Two Swords has a wax museum in Hollywood, their Elvis model is very lifelike, with a beautiful jumpsuit, far better than London's effort. So, it's goodbye to Hollywood, and we head east, to Nashville. This is RCA's famous Studio B. Elvis first recorded here on the 20th of March, 1960, on his return from his army service. Elvis first went to Nashville to record in January 1956, after signing with RCA. His first million seller, Heartbreak Hotel, cut on the 10th of January 1956, was recorded at the old studios on McGavock Street. He used Studio B from March 1960 onwards. Over 20 sessions here produced many gold discs. Amongst the Nashville million sellers were It's Now or Never, Are You Lonesome Tonight, Devil in Disguise, I've Lost You, Surrender, His Latest Flame, and Good Luck Charm. Some of his finest work on the religious albums His Hand in Mine and How Great Thou Art was recorded here, plus seasonal music and outstanding album tracks like Reconsider Baby, I Met Her Today, Tomorrow's a Long Time, Stranger in the Crowd, and I'll Remember You. The Nashville sound, justifiably famous, with the excellence of studio musicians like Floyd Kramer, Hank Garland, Boots Randolph, Charlie McCoy, and of course the Jordanaires. Elvis's producers were Bill Porter and Felton Jarvis. And he often warmed up with gospel jams and liked to get the right atmosphere. For instance, he had a decorated tree in the studio whilst cutting Christmas songs and had the lights turned off while singing the girl of my best friend. He last recorded at Studio B in June 1971. Today, the studio is a tourist attraction. These gold-plated discs are part of the customised interior decor of a unique vehicle, Elvis's gold Cadillac limousine on display at Nashville's Country Music Hall of Fame. The car, a 1960 Cadillac Fleetwood Series 75, was personalised by Hollywood's King of the Custom, George Barris, at his custom shop in Van Nuys, California. The interior of the car is the ultimate in luxury and opulence. The gold-plated fittings include a refrigerator, a shoe buffer, an entertainment console with RCA record player and swivel TV, a tape deck, a vanity case with gold electric razor and hair clipper, and a dual gold flake telephone set into the rear seat armrest. Gold lame curtains cover the windows and the rear seats designed for comfort. A guitar-shaped plaque carries Elvis's engraved signature.
The Cadillac is painted with 40 coats of a paint made from crushed diamonds and oriental fish scales, giving a highly polished translucent pearl effect. Headlight rims, front grille, wheel covers and hubcaps are all 24 karat gold plated. This magnificent car cost $100,000 and it's a vehicle fit for a king. Elvis drove it occasionally in the early 60s, but it was used mainly by RCA in the mid 60s in various promotions for Elvis's records. It also went on tour to Australia and other places, but never came to Britain. Memphis's beautiful Hernando de Soto Bridge was built in the early 70s. The house in Alabama Street, where Elvis lived in the early 50s, was demolished to make way for the Interstate 40 Expressway and the bridge. An aerial view of downtown Memphis's skyline and Main Street, which is now the pedestrianised Mid-America Mall. We're back in Beale Street at Elvis Presley Plaza, a memorial park opposite Lansky's. Memphis's impressive Elvis statue stands in the centre of the plaza. It was sculpted by Eric Parks of Philadelphia and modelled on the head of a Greek statue. Commissioned by the Memphis Development Foundation, the nine and a half foot tall bronze statue was unveiled on the 14th of August 1980 by the mayor of Memphis, Wyeth Chandler. The unveiling was filmed for the David Frost documentary Elvis, he touched their lives. The statue is acknowledged by many to be the finest of several Elvis statues around the world. Wild in the country, just across the state line from Tennessee and about 15 minutes drive from Graceland, is the 163-acre Circle G Ranch, which Elvis bought in 1967 for $300,000. In 1966, he'd bought a horse for Priscilla, which he'd named Domino, and a beautiful spirited Palomino, the rising sun, for himself, plus another 15 horses for his family and friends. There wasn't enough room at Graceland, so he acquired the rolling ranch at Walls, Mississippi, and moved all the horses there. There were already over a hundred head of Santa Gertrudis cattle on the ranch. Elvis and Priscilla spent part of their honeymoon in a trailer on the ranch in May 1967. In 1968, whilst Elvis and Priscilla were riding at the ranch, she lost a valuable ring and it was never found. There's a large, tranquil lake on the property, spanned by a bridge, under which numerous birds, probably swifts, find safe nesting sites in which to raise their young. An imposing feature on the property is the tall white cross close by the lake, which looks impressive when illuminated at night. Elvis sold the Circle G in 1969 for over $400,000. Since the spring of 1984, a very unusual sight has greeted people travelling along Elvis Presley Boulevard, Elvis's huge and beautiful Corvair 88 jet plane, the Lisa Marie, call sign Hound Dog One, is parked close by the highway almost opposite Graceland. On its tail, it proudly bears Elvis's TCB logo. Elvis bought the jet in 1975, had it refurbished, named it for his daughter, and used it for tours until June 1977. The engines have been removed and the plane's a popular attraction amongst the visitors to Graceland who are allowed to tour through the plane and see its opulent interior. We're looking at the Lisa Marie through Graceland's famous music gates across the multi-lane Elvis Presley Boulevard. The gates, which Elvis had installed in 1957, are electronically operated from the guard hut. How many fans have travelled to Memphis from all over the world and stood outside Graceland's front wall? 
The wall isn't 10 feet high, as some books have said. In several places, it's low enough to look over and gaze up at the house through the trees or at the pillars around the meditation garden. At the north end of the wall, just inside the gates, is the little guard house, once the domain of Elvis's affable Uncle Vesta. Whilst Elvis was alive, there was little or no graffiti to be seen on Graceland's front wall. But since August 1977, many fans have felt compelled to leave messages of love and hope on the wall. When you walk alongside the long fieldstone wall and read these messages, you'll find that they're written and usually signed and dated by fans from every corner of the world and every state of the USA. Many of the messages are very touching and almost all are from the heart. Not every fan writes on the wall, of course. There are many who have some respect for Elvis's property. Outside Graceland's wall, on the evening of the 15th of August every year, thousands of fans gather for a moving candlelight vigil. They light their candles from a torch lit from the eternal flame at Elvis's grave and walk solemnly up to the meditation garden. On their return, many place their candles on top of the front wall. The number of messages on the wall increases greatly each August as many thousands of fans flock into Memphis to pay tribute to the King. Every so often the wall's sandblasted clean, but it doesn't take long for the fans' messages of love to reappear. The Graceland gates swing open. Welcome to Elvis's world and to his beautiful home. Graceland reposes in tranquil beauty. After the White House, Graceland is the most famous home in America and it's been host to over half a million visitors annually since it opened as a museum on the 7th of June 1982. Until Graceland opened to the public, few people had ever seen the back of the house. Elvis's grandmother, Minnie May Presley, lived in the East Wing until her death in 1980. Elvis's Aunt Delta lives here now with her little Pomeranian dog, Edmund II. A peaceful view from the paddock. Elvis had 17 horses stabled in Graceland's barn at one time. Now, only one or two of the original animals remain. Elvis's favourite, the much-loved Rising Sun, died in 1986 and lies at rest here in the pasture. In 1988, Graceland acquired a new young Palomino called Sun's Reflection. This famous logo needs little introduction and it adorns a very famous car, the oversized 1955 pink Cadillac that Elvis bought for his mother Gladys, although she didn't drive, and which he couldn't bear to part with after her death in 1958. It was last driven in April 1981 when it took part in the Hollywood style premiere of This Is Elvis at the Memphian Theatre. Since June 1982, the pink Cadillac has been a popular attraction at Graceland and now resides in the new car museum. Elvis loved motorcycles. One of the first things he bought after he became famous in 1956 was a powerful Harley Davidson. This special 1976 bicentennial model is possibly the last Harley Davidson he ever bought. It only has 363 miles on the clock. Elvis loved to put on his motorcycle leathers and helmet and ride around the deserted Memphis streets under cover of darkness. 
fans often got to meet him and get a photo or autograph when he stopped to fill up at Vickers Service Station, a little way from Graceland. This Harley Davidson, along with the pink Cadillac and his other vehicles, was also put on show in a new museum which opened opposite Graceland in the summer of 89. This is the elegant dining room at Graceland, looking across towards the living room. The living room is comfortably furnished and this is the view across to the dining room as seen from the entrance to the music room with its peacock windows. Sometimes there were a dozen people seated at the oval dining room table with Elvis at its head. The luxurious settee in the living room is 15 feet long and was specially made for Elvis. A portrait of the King in 1957, the year he bought Graceland, hangs in the living room. The decor downstairs at Graceland is very unusual and distinctive. The TV room has a mirrored ceiling and comfortable deep blue settees to relax on. Elvis collected statues of monkeys the house has several of them. He also liked to watch three games of football at the same time. Also in the TV wall is a record player. I always had a large collection of albums and singles and they're still there. Gospel albums are probably amongst these discs and albums by his favourites like Mario Lanza. Across the hallway from the TV room is the equally unique pool room. Elvis was a skilled pool player and he installed this table in 1957. And this tear, the tour guides tell you, was made by one of Elvis's friends. Elvis spent countless hours down in the pool room playing against his friends and usually winning. A beautiful Tiffany lamp hangs above the pool table. The room has a very warm and cosy feel to it. Both the walls and the ceiling are covered in a colourful fabric, 750 yards of it. Elvis seems to have been very fond of shells and coral. Maybe he brought them back as souvenirs of his visits to Hawaii. There are many beautiful and interesting objets d'art and pictures displayed in the pool room. The most unique room of all at Graceland is the Jungle Den. It's most fans' favourite room. Elvis found all of the intricately carved furniture with its animal motif in a Memphis showroom and bought the lot. He thought that it created a Hawaiian effect. This oversized chair was his favourite. He loved the Jungle Room. Very rarely seen, since it's not on the regular tours of Graceland, is the large and beautifully equipped kitchen with every modern appliance. There's a staircase that leads directly up to the first floor from the kitchen and Mary Jenkins, or one of the other cooks, would always be on hand to serve up anything that Elvis fancied. Every visitor to Graceland can't help but be fascinated by the trophy room, housed in a large separate building adjoining the house. The Hall of Gold is unique, and no one can fail to be impressed by row after row of gleaming gold, silver and platinum awards, literally hundreds of them, and new ones are still being added, as Elvis's records continue to sell in great quantities all over the world. His total sales passed a billion several years ago, and nobody else even comes close to that figure, and probably never will. That is why he's called the King. Even the most cynical tourist, the sort of person who will readily criticise Elvis's taste in decor inside the Graceland mansion, can only gaze in awe at this display. It says it all. The awards on display are not only from the USA, of course. They're from all over the world, 
Japan, France, West Germany, Norway, Britain, Canada, Holland, Sweden, Australia, the list goes on. This special quintuple award was given to Elvis for five million sales of Don't Be Cruel. The disc was released in 1956 with another classic, Hound Dog, on the other side. Elvis's biggest selling single was It's Now or Never in 1960. There were awards from many countries in the Hall of Gold for this disc, including one from Great Britain. It sold a million in six and a half weeks, topped the charts for nine weeks, and gave Elvis his first British gold disc. In 1968, Elvis made his television comeback in a memorable special, and the black leather suit he wore still evokes great emotion. Earthy, streetwise, and very, very sexy. On this rack of jumpsuits are the blue Tiffany suit from 1972 and the caped fringed white suit from 1970. This, of course, is the fringed beaded jumpsuit from That's the Way It Is. The Memphis 74 suit. Sneakers, slippers, boots and the blue and white shoes that Elvis wore in the Steve Allen show in 1956. More fancy boots. This very ornate suit was worn in Las Vegas in August and September 1973 and when Elvis was recorded live at the Mid-South Coliseum on the 20th of March 1974, he wore it. Not surprisingly, it's known as the Memphis 74 suit. It's covered in multicoloured stones and gold studs and it looked truly sensational on the King. the red flower suit, a rare black suit from 1973, the ornately embroidered gypsy alpine suit from 1975, and 74's dragon suit, are amongst more of Elvis's colourful stage wear on show in the main hall of the trophy room. These close-ups of the jumpsuit legs show how intricate the stone and stud settings were, and the fine embroidery. And right at the end is the tiger suit. Elvis's pride as an American was displayed to the world in this suit from Aloha from Hawaii with its red, white and blue eagle motif. Surely the most famous suit in the world, worn by the most famous American in the world, Elvis. Elvis.